and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today for what should be a very, very interesting session. Um, I'm just here to welcome you on behalf of Aspen India and to say what a pleasure it is to have all of you here and uh, to also welcome our panelists today. Um, Heritage and I go back in my early, different hat. We go back a long time. Uh, today I'm wearing the Aspen Institute hat and uh, I hope this relationship also grows, Lisa, um, as we go forward. Um, uh, thank you so much to Raja and to Indrani for doing this. Uh, with that, Indrani, the diplomatic editor, um, and an interesting session, and over to you. Thank you. And, uh, <coughs> I will keep my comments short because you don't want to listen to my voice today. <clears throat> um, we have an, uh, a stellar panel, if I may say so, but the, the topic is even more interesting uh, because in this part of the world, we look at India and China in a very different way. And uh, we would, today we would hear about uh, how the India-China, the coming India-China dynamic, um, how it will define, how it will shape uh, the strategic uh, landscape of Asia in the 21st century the role that the U.S. plays, because the U.S. Uh, remains uh, a premier uh, Asian power. To, uh, to discuss uh, this issue, we have Dr. Kim Holmes, is the Vice President of Foreign and Defense Policy <coughs> and the Director of the Davis Institute of International Studies at the Heritage Foundation. <coughs> he directs the Heritage uh, team of experts in a variety of foreign policy sectors and is recognized as one of Washington's foremost foreign and defense policy experts. Uh, Dr. Holmes will kick off the discussion this afternoon. Uh, he will be followed by Raja Mohan, who needs absolutely no introduction in this city. Uh, he is uh, the strategic affairs editor. He is, he is the strategic affairs editor. It doesn't matter what his journalistic affiliations are. And um, uh, I, con considering I am from rival newspaper, we, uh, we all sort of, in the morning, we wake up and we read Raj first, first thing. Uh, Lisa has been, is a familiar name in India uh, because um, as a senior research uh, fellow at the Heritage Foundation and South Asian Issues, uh, she's a widely read uh, scholar um, on, uh, on all South Asian uh, issues and is, uh, is cited by journalists, uh, politicians and scholars alike. She has testified numerous times at the, at the, uh, in the Congress on the Hill. and. <clears throat> And we'll today talk about the dynamics of India, Pakistan, and China, and how that uh, uh, shapes up moving, going forward. I will kick off with Dr. Holmes. Would you like to? Yes, of course. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Indrani. Thank you, uh, Kieran, uh, for hosting us here. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be in India. It's a pleasure to be at the Aspen Institute. It's a pleasure to, to, to see you again, Karen. We have uh, just completed, uh, the Heritage Foundation has a two-day conference uh, with the, um, uh, the Observer Research Foundation on counterterrorism. And I see we have some, uh, some friends who are also at that, uh, at, that, at that conference. We just finished it three hours ago, so we're now having to shift gears. I've been thinking about Counterterrorism. Oh, Ambassador, I didn't see you. He was the, the co-host is right here in front of us, Ambassador Gostra. Uh, so we have to shift gears and now uh, talk about uh, some other geopolitical issues. And what I want to talk about is spend some time talking about India, uh, China, and the United States. Uh, the Heritage Foundation has spent the last uh, several years uh, institutionally increasing our focus on South Asia, and uh, we put resources into it. We've hired. Uh, Lisa Curtis, uh, we have programs such as the one we just recently did on counterterrorism to reflect our growing interest uh, in South Asia, and particularly in India. Uh, we believe that uh, this interest reflects the uh, growing relationship between our countries, over the, not only over the past decade, but over what we expect to see happen in the future. Certainly with uh, India's dramatic economic growth, but also along with China's, uh, this is one of the most important geostrategic uh, developments uh, in the world uh, over the past decade. 
Together, these booming economies account for one third of the world's population. So it's natural that the policy decisions will increasingly impact developments in Asia and elsewhere, and certainly impact U.S. interests. Today, uh, you hear many people say that the economic <coughs> center of gravity in the world is shifting rapidly from the West uh, to the East. Uh, India and China are certainly key contrib contributors in that assessment. The current leadership in Washington uh, appears to be taking relations with India much more seriously now than they were just a few months or so ago. Uh, you can witness this in the recent visits of uh, various high-level officials to India. General Jones was here last week, Ambassador Holbrook was here last week, and we understand that Adam Mullen is coming here this week. It's not just the strengthening of U.S. India relations that is on our radar screen, uh, but also India's growing relationship with China that holds uh, certainly Washington's interest. Uh, National Security Advisor Xi Chengkamen in his three-day visit to China earlier this month helped foster better dialogue over long-standing border disputes. And I believe, uh, and I think many of my uh, uh, fellow Americans believe that this is welcome. But India also is uh, watching them closely you know, to see whether China will move forward with the controversial proposal to sell the two nuclear reactors to Pakistan. Uh, China's historical nuclear and military ties to Pakistan certainly raised suspicions in India, understandably so, and a new nuclear deal would only heighten those concerns. And certainly we've seen in the last uh, weeks and months uh, <coughs> that was, uh, Indian government seeking to improve relations with Pakistan. Uh, the bumps in the road that occurred over the last few days shows, of course, that those two countries have a long ways to go. There are certain ways that uh, India and China could engage uh, in their mutual interest, and trade is certainly one of them. Uh, trade, India's trade with China accounts for some 10% of its total foreign trade, and both are strong trading partners with the United States. And I just heard just a minute ago in a discussion that uh, uh, that, that the United States is, uh, is slipping as the largest uh, uh, trading partner with India. And this is largely because of China. Yet in some respects, this also, this fact also adds to the competition between India and China for influence in the region. And we must admit that China's power and influence has grown more rapidly than India's has during these years that I am discussing. And China appears to be positioning itself to counter India's geostrategic influence in the region quite specifically. We saw this in 2008, uh, China's last objective to try to sell the U.S.-India civil nuclear agreement at the, at the uh, nuclear suppliers group meeting. I think that was a clear sign that to most Indians that Beijing is still not comfortable with India's rise, nor with New Delhi's strengthening partnership with Washington. Uh, China is uh, increasingly assertive, uh, asserting more controls over sea lanes that are important to its economy. It recently passed a milestone, now, now importing over 50% of its oil that it consumes. Its dependency on energy imports makes the Malacca Straits, which uh, straddles oil supply routes, in their estimation a key choke point. Now, while acknowledging this dependency must be an important part of China's decision making, Quite a few American analysts, and that includes uh, those at the Heritage Foundation and governments in the East uh, Asian region, are concerned that the China's assertiveness in the South China Sea uh, and, and points north indicate a break from the impartial access the U.S. Navy has long provided. Along with China's uh, desire to protect its oil supplies, come extraordinary and unsettling territorial claims conflicting with at least six of their maritime neighbors. Now, there's no doubt that India's rising defense budgets and its growing navy give Beijing concern that its energy supplies that pass through the Malacca Straits will increasingly be at the mercy of India. But there are fears here in India, and frankly, among some uh, in the United States, and <coughs> certainly that, uh, that the, even uh, certainly the Obama administration as well, uh, that, or rather, there was concerns that 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 the Obama administration's more conciliatory approach towards China uh, could actually embolden China's influence and give them uh, an unexpected uh, boost in influence in the Asia Pacific region. Some in the United States complained that President Obama's lack of attention on China's human rights record 
and his uh, refusal to meet with the Dalai Lama before he, before he got to, uh, to Beijing showed that he is uh, more interested in placating with China than in managing balance of power politics in Asia. Uh, the dynamic displayed at, at the United Nations Security Council debates over Iran and also over North Korea are the latest manifestation of, of this tendency. Uh, China has been testing American resolve on several fronts. One is a response to the North Korean torpedo attack on the South Korean naval vessel. Another is its uh, proposal to sell two nuclear reactors to Pakistan. Even though, as a member of the nuclear suppliers group, it is forbidden to sell nuclear technology to non-signatories of PNPT. Finally, after staying silent on this issue for weeks, uh, Washington has said China needs to seek approval for the deal from the NSG. Since most NSG members will be unlikely to approve the deal, China must now weigh whether it will move ahead with the deal despite likely negative international reaction. Now another question we hear uh, in Washington is whether China might take on more responsibility to help bring stability to the volatile Afghanistan, Pakistan region especially given, uh, the, given its concerns about influence of global Islamist radicals on its own rest of the uh, weaker Muslim populations. And Washington is watching China's attitudes in particular towards Afghanistan. The $3.5 billion contract, it wanted to develop a major copper field there, marked the largest foreign direct investment in Afghanistan's history. While China may be willing to increase its economic stakes, States in Afghanistan, it is where of any long term U.S. and NATO military presence in the region and is unwilling to cooperate directly with coalition forces. There are concerns in Washington, particularly among conservatives, regarding U.S. defense budget. Many feel that the current administration is being short sighted in restraining defense spending and also not taking seriously. China's long-term military ambitions. We saw where Secretary Gates questioned whether we need to maintain 10 carrier battle groups when others have none. We think this attitude underestimates China's strategic ambitions and ultimately uh, is a, in its ability to challenge the United States predominance in the Western Pacific. A year-long uh, presence uh, in the anti-piracy patrols all the Gulf of Aden Coupled with China's comments regarding the building of base infrastructure in the region suggests that the PRC intends to be a long-term player in the area. So the bottom line is I think the United States needs to demonstrate its resolve to stay engaged in the vital Asia Pacific region, including the Indian Ocean. This is not uh, to mean or to imply that the United States Navy or the United States is adopting a policy to contain China, uh, but it is also it is to say that the region is vital to our interests, including strengthening relations with India. Uh, so we see this uh, in the willingness to sell India advanced weaponry uh, and technology cooperation, which includes uh, advanced space systems, and also providing civil nuclear technology. Our relations are mutually beneficial across the range of issues. This has a value in and of itself. We understand that, we hope India understands that, but we also believe uh, that China will look at this, uh, rightfully so, as a, uh, as, as a growing friendship between India and the United States. We hope that uh, both sides consider deepening this effort, including through more active security cooperation, more robust dialogue, and the challenge facing the prosperous and peaceful development of the Asia Pacific region, which is what all of us should be interested in. Thank you very much for your attention. Rajamal, Rajamal, I think, uh, look at the question from the Indian perspective, and we'll talk about the India-China perspective with, and how we see the U.S.'s role, and how we see each other's role uh, going forward. Raj. Thank you. Thank you, Rani. Well, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon, once again, with the Aspen platform. Uh, 
the title of the discussion today is uh, India China and the Changing Asian Strategic Landscape. Uh, well, there seems to be nothing wrong with the title. Uh, it's not often, uh, it's pretty recent actually, you can talk about India in the same breath as China. Uh, or for that matter, thinking about India in the context of Asian strategic landscape. Uh, while for most Indians uh, don't seem to think it is something new, uh, I lived in Singapore for the last three years, and, and, uh, and the debate there, uh, when you hear the East Asians debate about India, uh, many of them still wonder, does India really belong to Asia? Uh, because the definition of Asia for many East Asians, perhaps largely ends with Burma, I mean, not just talking about the racial notion of Asia, uh, but the fact that, uh, that India was not a part of the Asian dynamic for a number of decades. Uh, so it is still, we almost didn't become a member of the East Asia Summit in 2005, because the Chinese friends thought, uh, East Asia, what is India doing in East Asia? Uh, right now India is a member, but even now, a lot of people want to know what is India doing in a summit called East Asian Summit. So here I think the, the, how we think about geography here, I think it's, it's important uh, that uh, where does one region begin, where does one region end? I'd uh, love to go back to my job as a teacher in school, she's a very good looking and very, very good teacher, but the fact is, uh, it is not something, uh, school teacher is going to tell you where does Asia begin and where does Asia end. Uh, that continents, regions, much like nations, are also imagined communities. It depends on a particular context, a particular history. Because as late as 1945, uh, that uh, it was the Indian troops at the end of the Second World War, uh, which were taking surrender of the Japanese troops as far as up to as Hanoi. Uh, that it was Indian troops that pushed the Japanese out of Burma, uh, that liberated Singapore, uh, liberated Indonesia, uh, and liberated uh, Vietnam. Now, it's very we've forgotten that history. We don't much claim our past history in terms of what we were doing in the Second World War. And much of Asia too forgot about us. Uh, it's largely because, in spite of the fact that India's first diplomatic initiatives were about Asia, uh, we largely walked out uh, with our fascination for the non aligned the global non aligned movement, uh, and we disconnected ourselves about trade. Uh, we were not interested in trade anymore. Uh, we said we're not interested in imports, we're not interested in exports. So it, the, the state of Indian economy might be disconnected also from Asia. I think the big story in Asia today is that India is coming back. Uh, the fact that you have today, uh, India has spoken in the same breath as China, or India has spoken in the same breath as in, in, in Asia, uh, is the fact that uh, India is uh, coming back into the understanding of, uh, in Asia, about Asia, and how the rest of the world thinks about uh, India and India and Asia. So let me just address uh, three sets of issues uh, in relation to this. One is, uh, how does the uh, emergence of India uh, produce uh, the, the difference or make a difference to the great power relations in Asia that includes the United States? Uh, second, in terms of what is uh, the emergence of India? I mean, always differentiate between saying a rising China and an emerging India. There's a bit of difference between us, though we love to see ourselves as equals. Uh, China, three decades of 10% uh, growth, China has risen or rising. Uh, India is just beginning to pick up its growth rate. So we're still emerging. So in a sense, uh, there, is, there is that gap, there is a difference that, that we must recognize as real as. Uh, but the fact is, an emerging India uh, is going to be part of uh, the, the great power politics of Asia. It's going to be part of the regional balance of power politics in Asia, uh, as well as the uh, regional institutions. And finally, let me end up uh, with some thoughts on uh, what does it mean for India and China. Because uh, as India and China change, they're changing the world, they're changing the region, uh, they're also going to change their bilateral relations. So, that's, so let me just address this, uh, these sets of issues. First, in terms of the great power relations, uh, that, as I said, uh, for most of the major powers, uh, when they thought about Asia, when they thought about other powers in Asia, India, India did not really matter. Uh, it was uh, George W. Bush. Uh, when they put India back, they saw the, an emerging India as part of the balance of our politics in Asia. And I think for the first time, you had an American president willing to look at India as part of a larger picture in Asia, rather than the narrow prism of South Asia, which most American presidents have done, and many of us suspect Mr. Obama might be going back to uh, the Democrats, shall we say, uh, to, a, to an approach that, that is an old approach. But the fact is uh, that uh, much of the debate on the nuclear deal 
was the bond that New Balance had followed. And it was not surprising that the Chinese did everything they could uh, until they were caught with their hand in the cookie jar uh, in blocking the indo US nuclear deal. And today, why they do a deal with Pakistan as a very balanced deal. Uh, so it, it was really George W. Bush. I think he changed the perception of India, the imagination about India, and putting India in a balance of our system as a nation. And I think with the, when you move the big piece, a lot of small pieces also move. Uh, then you have now Japan today, which now used to think of India as part of Asia. Japan's conception of Asia ended in Burma. But Japan today uh, has signed declaration, the security declaration with India, the only country other than the United States and Australia with which Japan today has a, has a security declaration, uh, has a request to dialogue under this much expansion of the defense relationship. Uh, so, so what you have is the, that uh, some of the major powers of Asia are beginning to factor in uh, uh, the, the, the India into the, uh, into the calculus uh, of uh, great power relations. But the central problem is, of course, how the U.S. will think about it. There, I think, uh, we have a set of problems with the, with the current administration in Washington. Uh, they talk about a G2. They talk about uh, U.S. and China getting together, uh, that they're going to run a condominium. Uh, that's one thing that clearly uh, is not acceptable uh, in this country and will not be accepted, uh, whatever reasons. So, uh, that, I think, in terms of where the U.S. is headed vis a vis its relationship with India, will remain a central element here in terms of how we think about uh, our foreign policy or strategic uh, Second, in terms of the, the, uh, the great the regional relationships, now, as India and China are growing at 10%, uh, that they will they are already have begun to bend the spaces around them. That is, traditionally, it was quite easy to see uh, India and South Asia, China and East Asia, the two different spheres. But a China that grows at 10%, and India that's growing at 8%, bend the spaces around them. So I think the distinctions that we often make between uh, South Asia and East Asia are beginning to disappear because where uh, the India's influence is going to grow in East Asia, China's influence is going to grow in South Asia. So the, the artificial division that we made all these years, most Indians, we don't want the Chinese in South. Uh, we wonder what the Chinese are doing in Sri Lanka, or what they're doing in Nepal, because they uh, Nepal and Bhutan have a border with, I see the Ambassador Bhutan here, uh, they have a border uh, with, uh, uh, with with China. But today China not only limited to the northern Himalayas, but they're also coming into the Indian Ocean. So the growth of China will connect it more and more to South Asia. Similarly, the growth of India is going to connect it back to East Asia in ways in which we've not done before. So as the bend in the peripheries, as the influence begins to grow, uh, we're going to step on each other's toes quite a bit. So resolving that in terms of how do we prevent from getting into each other's air or toes, whatever you want to call it, and that is going to be an important issue. And that's why you see much of the debate today, uh, how much of a role of China in South Asia is acceptable to India? Why did India try to prevent China from entering South? Uh, the Chinese think uh, we don't uh, let the Chinese uh, operate in South Asia, because the Chinese think they have an equal right as India uh, to have a relationship with the rest of the South Asian countries, while many in India seem to think we have an exclusive sphere of influence in South Asia, nobody else should come in. Uh, that clash, you could begin to see, and similarly in the Pacific, you see India uh, doing more and more uh, in terms of its economic cooperation, security cooperation today with Vietnam, uh, with, uh, with Japan, with a range of countries, that many Chinese ask, what is India doing? Uh, Indian Navy, what is Indian Navy doing in the Pacific? I can understand they want to see from the Gulf, but what are they doing in the Pacific? It's a good question. Uh, the question, of course, is from the Indian side, India wants to keep the sea lanes open, therefore it is going to operate uh, in the Western Pacific. That this week in the third century to issues in terms of uh, the institutions. As I said, uh, we've tried hard to keep the Chinese out of South. Finally, they've gotten us out of the uh, Chinese tried to keep us out of East Asia Summit. We managed to get in because Indonesia and the Singaporean and, the, and the, uh, some other East Asians wanted us inside. The Japanese wanted us in. Uh, Chinese still not going to let us in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So you have then uh, both of us trying to say, look, this is my little plot, we're not going to let them in. So that struggle in terms of how do we construct regional institutions. So, so I'm not one of those liberal institutionalists who believe all you need is to have a good multilateral organization, boom, the world is going to be a happy place. And then you have the Democrats seem to believe that in Washington. Uh, but the fact is, the, the politics within the multilateral organization reflects the power of politics, and it is not the international institutions multilateral institutions are not going to transcend or uh, overwhelm the power politics that are created in the region. That brings me to the, the last set of issues in terms of uh, how, what happens to the bilateral relationship. Here I think 
uh, India and China, much as the world around them has changed, they have changed internally, that the time has come for them to redo their relationship. Uh, in, I believe that uh, Mr. Menon, Chief Shankar Menon's visit to, visit to China was about uh, finding a way to rebalance the relationship. That is, we had a phase in the 50s where it was all romance about Hindi, Chini, Bhai, Bhai, but of course, we were sweep, sweeping problems under the carpet. Uh, that phase came to an end with the war in 62. Uh, then we had for almost 20 years no relationship. And then in 1988, when Mr. Rajiv Gandhi went to, went to China, uh, tried to normalize the relationship, we created a new framework. And I think what we've seen is that in the last 25, 22, 22 odd years that uh, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi went to China, the, the situation has changed significantly. Uh, today, India and China have a relationship, have a significant relationship. That is, of course, has removed the problems. But what has changed is that China is today is going to be inevitably our, our largest trading partner. Uh, it's already about to replace the United States. I think pretty close on the, on the merchant, merchandise goods. Uh, but um, when you put software, the US is still, still number one. But I think the logic as it happened everywhere in the rest of Asia, from so Japan downwards, that China is going to be the, the dominant economic power. So in some sense, that has created problems in terms of dumping, in terms of uh, regulatory issues that the Indian industry has complained. But it's also opened up opportunities. That for too long, the foreign officers, and within the foreign office, we used to call a small China tweak, uh, that uh, the potted plant that they would guard, uh, nobody else would understand the jargon they were speaking in, Muma, Mamu, whatever it was. That it was like a little sort of specialized you know, plant that was cultivated and only a few people could watch it. But today, with $60 billion of trade between the two countries, all the Philippians are getting into this relationship. And today you have the expansion of the relationship of large numbers of people who are traveling, not directly, but through other parts, and engaging in business up is dramatically transforming the relationship. And then you have a situation where, while the foreign office would still want to control the relationship, and you have the Reliance and Tata's talking about objecting to the current government's policy of trying to restrict uh, Chinese capital goods in important <coughs> Europe. So there are groups that are being created in India who find the value and benefit in engaging China. So in that sense, that we need to transform the, the relationship. In a sense, it's going to be more widespread. It's not going to be limited to uh, the diplomats and the foreign office of the security community. There is a large economic element in the relationship which is going to create a very interesting dynamic between the two. That doesn't, of course, take away the problems that exist. That as two rising powers, uh, we're going to come into a conflict with each other uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the stepping on each other's toes, the sense of where are the red lines for each other to cross. Uh, that is, how far, what would be an acceptable Chinese presence in South Asia for India? What's an acceptable Indian presence in, India, in, in Pacific for the Chinese? So these issues are going to come, and I think we need to find a way of thinking about it, negotiating them, and finding ways to live together. And then, uh, the, 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 whether we succeed in this or not, I think will depend crucially on what the United States does. And there, I think, let me conclude with this thought. Uh, the US has swung from one extreme to the other. That, uh, that, the, that if the Bush administration, we thought, had laid out a new template, it's not that the Bush administration's relations with China were bad. Actually, towards the end of the <coughs> uh, they were improving relations. In fact, for the first time, you had uh, an American administration that was simultaneously improving relations with both China and India. But yet, uh, the, the current administration, it's talk about G2, uh, though they've denied it, and Mr. Manmohan Singh was in Washington, they said India is important. But in terms of operational policies of Washington, that it is one of trying to accommodate China than one of balancing China. So that leads to some long-term implications for India. Second, there's also many Asians are beginning to feel where the U.S. has the stomach to actually maintain its privacy in Asia. Uh, economically, you're beginning to lose ground. Uh, see what's happened in the Korean Peninsula the last few days. Uh, that the U.S. seemed to have blinked uh, not to send its aircraft carrier into the, uh, into the, into the Yellow Sea. That, that does the U.S. have, or shall I put it, that does, do the American liberals have the stomach to deal with the rising China? And I think that question in terms of the nature of the U.S. relationships with this part of the world the nature of the U.S. alliances with this part of the world. We saw the U.S.-Japan alliance enter into a very, very shaky period. And here we were talking just last two months ago, America talking about strengthening its alliance with South Korea, and there you have 
we are trying to do something for South Korea vis-a-vis -vis the North, and the Chinese step in and say, look, boom, here is a red line, here is a no-go zone, you can't move. So the question is, has the U.S. the capacity to maintain its own alliance? Does the U.S. have the capacity to keep its markets open at the time of the domestic energy crisis? Does the U.S. have the capacity to project power into the Western Pacific, which is the basis on which a large number of countries have constructed the security policy? All of these, I think, the variable is the United States. So a lot would depend on what the United States will do. And, and, and therefore, the uncertainty in the U.S. today, what we've seen happen in the last few two years of this administration is the U.S. has become a normal nation. It's no longer exceptional. Uh, it's no longer things of itself as special. And therefore, uh, if the U.S. downs itself down as a power, uh, it will have consequences for Asia, which is where the great theater for the new rivalry that is taking place. And finally, whatever the U.S. does or does not do, there is an autonomous dynamic to India-China relationship. Where the U.S. wants to take advantage of it is, is a desire the U.S. must decide. Because our karma is to balance the Chinese. But whatever the U.S. does, because when the U.S. and China were together, even then, we had to balance the Chinese. And, and therefore, uh, there is no escape for us from our karma uh, of balancing the Chinese, because the Chinese think they're number one, uh, India can't accept number two position in Asia. So therefore, you're going to have a situation where uh, a balance, uh, in balancing game will continue for quite some time to come. That doesn't mean we are in the game of containing each other, but one where we must find a way, India and China, We'll, we'll, we'll struggle hard I think, to find a way of uh, how we structure a, a, a region in which both of us uh, can meet our aspirations. Uh, if the U.S. plays a, a very vital balancing role in this region, the one troubling factor in the India-China relationship matrix is the, is Pakistan and. Uh, in the past few years, that has only grown. Uh, you will find Indian uh, scholars and Indian thinkers talking about Pakistan as a force multiplier for China, just as Pakistan uses terrorists as force multipliers for itself. And to hear how pa Pakistan figures in the India-China dynamic and how it will shape, shape the India-China dynamic, we have these researchers from the, from the Heritage Foundation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Indrani, uh, for that nice introduction. And um, some of you might know, but most of you probably don't, Indrani was just in the US educating Americans uh, about India and India-China relations and all these issues. So I look forward to hearing from her uh, after I speak. And thank you very much, Karen Patricia, for uh, having us here today to the CII and the Aspen Institute. And I'd like to acknowledge Ambassador Ross Gotra Ambassador Sybil, uh, very nice to see you here today. Uh, and we just hosted a wonderful counterterrorism conference with, with Bork, as uh, Dr. Holmes pointed out. And I would just like to say, uh, sometimes you have a tough act to follow. I would say I have a nearly impossible act to follow, uh, but I'll, I'll do my best and try to not uh, uh, send anyone to sleep. So the U.S. interest in building ties to India over the last decade has been driven by several factors, including, of course, India's economic liberalization starting in the early 90s and the increased opportunities for trade and investment and partnerships, uh, the common values we share as two pluralistic democracies, which I think really was driven uh, home by the 9-11 attacks, and our broadly converging strategic interests particularly in counterterrorism. But we cannot deny that China's rise as a global power has also spurred closer ties between our two nations. The relationship between the US and India is moving forward in a variety of areas. As I mentioned, counterterrorism, defense, military to military ties, education, trade, uh, so many issues. And I think we really saw this progress highlighted during the strategic dialogue between the US and India, which took place in June. Now, during Prime Minister Singh's state visit to Washington last November, President Obama referred to India as a rising and responsible power, and he encouraged India's role in helping shape the political and security environment in Asia. Uh, 
Both leaders emphasized the common commitment to democratic values such as individual freedom, rule of law, religious pluralism, uh, all as a basis for a stronger U.S. and U.S. relationship and more cooperation. Now, President Obama has also, I would say, evolved his view on Kashmir, and he's tempered his enthusiasm for the U.S. Uh, trying to get more deeply involved in this, this intractable issue. So I think he's come a long way from the position that he took as a presidential candidate when he called for appointing the Kashmir envoy to uh, just uh, last November when he hosted the uh, Indian Prime Minister when he said the U.S. would not seek to resolve long-standing Indo-Pakistan <coughs> disputes, but would instead encourage ways in which both countries can feel secure and focus on the development of their own countries and people. Now let's talk a little bit about this um, India-China-Pakistan triangle uh, issue. Uh, on the issue of the new nuclear reactor sales that China has proposed for Pakistan, which um, Kim noted, uh, after several weeks of sort of virtual science, silence from the US administration on the issue, the administration finally came forward and said that China would have to go through the nuclear suppliers group before moving ahead with this deal. And I think given the widespread proliferation that resulted from the Pakistan-based AQ Khan network, as well as continued concerns about the existence of terrorist networks in Pakistan that seek access to nuclear weapons technology. I think a nod, a nod from Washington to further Chinese-Pakistani nuclear cooperation would be extremely short-sighted. And I think this argument that somehow the China-Pakistan nuclear reactor deal can be equated or seen in the same light as the U.S.-India civil nuclear deal discounts the vastly different proliferation records between Pakistan and India, the different oversight requirements generally imposed by the U.S. compared to China, and the prevalence of Pakistan-based terrorist groups seeking nuclear weapons technology that I just raised. I think as time has passed, Pakistan has uh, tried to argue that the AQ Khan affair is part of history, should be put away, and indeed, Pakistan pressed the U.S. for a civil nuclear deal uh, in the U.S.-Pakistan strategic dialogue talks, which took place in March. But I think the U.S. has made it clear since then that this is something that would not be on the cards. <clears throat> but I think another sign of the sort of deep-seated issues, I'll call them, between India and China is the uptick in the attention to the disputed borders issue, which we've seen over the last three, three and a half years, uh, especially with regard to our Anantra Pradesh and Chinese statements protesting a, uh, visits by the Dalai Lama to Tawang, the uh, pilgrimage site for the Tibetans in the state. Um, so I think while things have simmered down, which I think Roger alluded to in the last couple of months, and as demonstrated by the Indian National Security Advisor's visit to Beijing, uh, recent visit, I think the border tensions will continue uh, to be an issue between India and China for the foreseeable future. So in addition to deepening the alliance with Pakistan, China also is increasingly reaching out to other South Asian states. And I'll just talk a little bit about Sri Lanka. Chinese assistance to Sri Lanka has increased substantially over the past few years. And it now eclipses that of uh, Sri Lanka's longtime biggest donor, Japan. Uh, Chinese are building a highway, they're developing power plants, constructing a port. Uh, so there, there's obviously a, a stronger relationship building there. But at the same time, as Roger mentioned, India is also seeking to build political economic, economic ties with the states of Southeast Asia. And I would say the Southeast Asian states generally welcome India's involvement in the region. So in addition to increasingly joining the different uh, Asian groupings such as ASEAN, which India joined in 1995, 
the ASEAN Regional Forum, which joined in 1996, and the East Asian Summit, uh, of which is also a member of. In addition to this, uh, India is building economic relations in the region, signed the Great Trade Deal with the ASEAN countries in December 2008. Um, it's also enhanced its naval profile in Southeast Asia, and is now holding periodic naval exercises with a variety of these countries. Let me just uh, touch on a few points on the India-Japan relationship, because I think this is an important relationship, as, as Roger pointed out. I think the recent Japanese governments have uh, consistently demonstrated keen interest in expanding Japan-India relations. Uh, India is looking to Japan for investment. And to this end, Tokyo has pledged $4.5 billion in soft loans toward the Delhi-Mumbai Railway Freight Corridor. Very major, significant investment. And Japan's support for the U.S.-India civil nuclear deal signaled for the first time Tokyo acknowledging India's status as a responsible member of the nuclear regime. Uh, Japan and India have also increased their military contacts, the uh, security contacts that, that Roger mentioned, maritime cooperation. Uh, so you definitely see expansion of this, this relationship as well. Let, let me just conclude by saying, you know, although obviously India and the U.S. share many common interests that I've just laid out, um, we're not going to agree on every single issue, obviously. Um, I think India will certainly leave its strategic options open to a certain degree. We'll avoid being tied down in any alliance uh, with any major power at this stage as it's emerging. But I believe still it is strongly in the U.S. interest to continue to build these ties to India, which will, India will increasingly play this kind of stabilizing role in Asia. I think this is how the U.S. sees it. Uh, we do share concerns about China's military modernization, and we both view, both of our countries view, view with some wariness signs of Chinese military presence in and around the Asian Ocean. So, uh, we at the Heritage Foundation very much support the idea of encouraging an Indian role specifically in the U.S.-Japan-Australia trilateral dialogue. Uh, we believe the fact that India shares our respect for democratic principles matters a great deal. And that partnering with India and Asia uh, as much as possible uh, should be an emphasis of the Obama administration. So I think the planned November visit from President Obama to come to India offers an opportunity to uh, take more initiatives in supporting India's role in Asia and, and building up our partnerships in this vital region. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, that was, it, I, I'm sure this, the discussion threw up a whole set of uh, very interesting ideas and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, questions from the floor, uh, just a, uh, a, t a tiny thought to leave behind, which is uh, it's in May when the U.S. had its uh, strategic dialogue with, with China and sent 200 officials to Beijing. Uh, a week later, the, the U.S. India strategic dialogue barely cobbled together 30 people in Washington. <clears throat> I do believe that uh, the India-U.S. dynamic really needs to uh, work much, much harder. We thought we'd worked a lot during the Bush administration, but we're going back to reinventing the wheel with the Obama administration. On the other hand, if you look at the India-China <coughs> relationship, uh, the Chinese have certainly moved in uh, other countries of South Asia. For instance, the China, there is much made of the fact that China has built the, is building this Ahmad Jordan port in, South, in southern Sri Lanka. What is less known is that India is <coughs> building its consulate in Sri Lanka, in Hubbard, Jota. It's, um, it moved there, of course, after the Chinese, but in a way, I think India would probably score a political point where China makes an economic point. And uh, the, the, the India-China game will continue, but right now, I will look for questions from the floor. Thank you. So. <coughs> Just a minute. Yeah. No, 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 just a minute. Yeah. Yeah. 
My name is Dr. Vipul Sahin. This is got to do with uh, the Maoists which keep coming in uh, India uh, and get supported. Uh, if China uh, sends us Maoists that should be, you know, retaliated by sending them Tibetans to blow up, say, the Beijing Glass of Rainbow Line, is that big for that? Just a kind question. Yeah. Is the Maoists uh, in Nepal or the Maoists in, in India? In India. I mean, Talking about India in the northeast of India, where the uh, you know munitions and all the same thing. That's one. The second is I've observed that uh, most acknowledged uh, military powers uh, manufacture their own weapons. We don't in India. I mean, we even import uh, bulletproof vests. And wouldn't be wouldn't it be better to outsource our defense uh, requirements to the USA? <laughs> It's a, it, it's a question you need to ask Mr. Ike Anthony. But uh, on the Maoist, uh, I think uh, on the Maoist, I think uh, uh, I think the Chinese have uh, officially told the Indian government that they would rather the, the, uh, these insurgents not be referred to as Maoists and, and much prefer the Indian government's official uh, description of left-wing extremists because uh, uh, they, they have said that they have very, very little to do with them. So far, as far as I know, uh, there, have been, there has been little um, that the Chinese have, support, have supplied or supported the Maoists in India, uh, especially in the, in the Red Corridor, what we know as the Red Corridor. Uh, they haven't even uh, done that much to the Maoists in Nepal, because when the Maoists were uh, an insurgency in Nepal, the Chinese was actually supporting the monarchy. Uh, so, but, uh, for the for the Maoists in India, we have a completely different question and a completely different set of answers. A lot of it has to do with India itself. In, in, a, in a bit, sir. Yes. Uh, this is to Dr. Raja Mohan. Uh, <coughs> uh, obvious determinants you mentioned: the economic power, the armament power. Uh, being an Indian, could you also elude your position if we just reverse uh, this need for uh, armament, both conventional and the nuclear, uh, to the power of leading Satyagraha and global disarmament in changing the landscape in Asia? Uh, we are competing with Pakistan in Afghanistan, who trains their military. Uh, so, this is one. Uh, disarmament. Second, uh, our response to emerging issues of climate crisis and how, third, uh, deepening of democracy process. Uh, the way uh, uh, American whites have disprivileged themselves and empowered the blacks over a period of time. Uh, similarly, the Asian elite, can we go back to Asian Relations Conference in 48, uh, 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 47 March or the Asian Socialist Conference, pick up threats from that and be a strategic player in a different paradigm altogether. Can India do that? Say you talk about disarmament will please the Obama administration quite a bit because they're talking about it as well. But I wouldn't bet on anything happening on disarmament. Uh, certainly, as Obama said, not in his lifetime, certainly not in our lifetime. So, so, while the aspiration to do something good of disarmament uh, might be there, as rising powers, China and India are going to build very large, very powerful military establishments. They do it smartly, as the Chinese do, or whether do it badly as the previous question pointed out. Uh, I think the fact is all great powers will build military capabilities and I don't see uh, any escape from that. The uh, question is can we do this in a manner that we don't destabilize the larger environment? That is the real issue, not whether we can trade uh, uh, military capacity for, for something else. <coughs> Second, in terms of democracy promotion, uh, it's it's not going to be easy. And I, I, I think that's going to be uh, when Bush, for example, which way that we have this Asian democratic well, well, yeah. Yeah. So there you are, actually, Mr. Tan General Tanshwe is going to be here next week. Uh, next week. Uh, and the interesting thing is China and India, one is a democracy, one is not. 
both of us have the same policy towards towards men bar, which is no interference in the return of affairs. Both of us need Burma for strategic reasons. So while we compete with each other, we do exactly the same thing in Burma. So I won't bet on either of us actually pushing the democratic argument too much, because I think the values argument will constantly run into the interest argument. Uh, so I think that's an issue. Uh, no way the government ever solves it. The US has not been able to solve it. Uh, but I think we'll have to find a way. You can't abandon your values, but you'll have to temper it with the large challenge of posting the national interest. Thank you. I'm Alun Bose, I'm an advocate for the Supreme Court and the advisor to the Charter. I've been known to ask a few questions and I would like the panel to respond. The two things worry me about China. One is the territorial claims. Like when China looks at, say, Arunachal Pradesh, it looks at Arunachal Pradesh almost as if Hitler was looking at the Suez lands. The second thing is not the specter of a nuclear war, but the specter of a different that hangs over the ebony of our eyes. And this is something which I, in fact, mentioned in the House of Lords last year, and the rest of the British leaders. This is one of the points which I raised. Today, China has the capacity to disable those systems digitally. It's not in terms of a nuclear or conventional weapons, it's digital warfare. There, I think, India and the United States have to work very closely together. And I remember, within two weeks after I gave this speech in the House of Lords, they actually intruded into the defense uh, system of the United Kingdom and uh, Gordon Brown was on the map. And at that point of time, I quoted Churchill and I said, trying to be friends with the communists is like wooing a crocodile. Yeah, you don't know whether to spit it. Uh, you know. So this is, uh, you know, in terms, the answer I think we should answer whether we should have a revival of the Kennedy Nehru spirit. That's all. Well, let me address uh, the larger question you put about, about China. The fact is, is that we, we're talking a lot about China rising, China's growing. All this is very true, it's very obvious. But if you look at what we can expect from China in the future, particularly the relations with India and the United States, there's two points that we have to keep in mind. First is, is that China is fundamental a revisionist power. It has issues, particularly with the United States and Taiwan, that are not settled in their estimation. And they believe in their minds that the United States is the main obstacle to why they cannot settle that issue. To them, it's not a foreign policy issue, a domestic issue. And they see the United States' involvement with Taiwan as an obstacle. The second is, is that it's already been mentioned that China is an authoritarian, it's not a democracy. This is extremely important. They have a political system uh, that is uh, insular. Uh, it, uh, I don't know what you even call it these days. It's not really communist in the old sense of the word. But it is acutely nationalistic. There is a strong ties between the PLA and the Communist Party uh, that uh, creates not only an internal authoritarian view but also channels many of these ideologies into their external relations as well, and an almost 19th century view of geopolitics, uh, which is uh, uh, not the kind of, so 21st century view that we hope the United States would have, or India would have. Other countries that have democratic and open systems tend to look at the world differently. I would even say this is the case with Russia, which is going backwards in that regard, and acting in its foreign policy more and more like the old Soviet Union in terms of spheres of influence over the Greek neighbors. So we have, to, we have to keep this in mind that when we talk about China, China modernizing, and it is doing that, and clearly its economy is growing extraordinarily. In some ways, it has a, a, almost an atavistic um, political uh, system and constitution, if you will, uh, that puts it at odds with many things that are in the modern world. Uh, and uh, even though it puts a sort of a modern face on, on, on its foreign policies of the United Nations and, and the way it's in, in playing an increasingly sort of soft power role in international affairs through the UN, uh, mainly because it's got more money and it can do it, it's involved in peacekeeping in Africa, it's doing all kinds of things we never do before. We should remember that, uh, that, that ultimately uh, it's an authoritarian regime which, frankly, the government itself sees as unstable. 
uh, they fear democracy, they fear opening up, and they also put that fear in their minds, uh, they attach it to uh, external relations, particularly the role of the United States in the world. Thank you. And Dr. Justin Paul, I'd like to ask a very basic question, uh, taking a clue from the point Dr. Lisa mentioned here, relating to diplomatic relationship between Japan, China, and India. I would say that Japan has been very successful in maintaining diplomatic relationship, even though uh, China doesn't maintain that much quality relationship with India. China has been often trying to maintain uh, good relations with Japan. For example, a couple of years ago, China had uh, liberalized their visa policies towards Japanese passport holders to enter the Chinese doors or Chinese borders without visa. Visa on arrival facility to the Japanese. And the same way, the Japanese government doesn't offer the same facility to the Chinese and even sometimes block the entry of Chinese to Japan. But Japan, of late, has been maintaining very good relations. My basic question is that we are talking about all these, and India has also welcomed Japanese tourists. We saw on arrival facility from January, and, and Japan is not doing that for them because of one million people and things like that. Uh, and my basic question recently, there was a report that the journalist from Japan has not been renewed visa to walk in India, citing that he is reporting some kind of uh, stories. So, in case, of course, in fact, India government has already opened up the visa policy for. Uh, 120 million people from What's Japan. The yeah. The question is that, suppose in case the journalist is not being renewed, even though government has already opened up visa for 120 million people, uh, how does this kind of diplomatic type relationship can improve? Yeah, because there's more, yeah. more caveats. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's absolutely wrong to compare India's relationship with China or India's relationship with Japan to some of Japanese relationship. The scale, the quantity, the trade, the interaction is a hundred times more. So we're nowhere near the density of the Sino-Japanese relationship. You stand in Beijing Airport, you see flights taking off to every Japanese city in every half hour. That's a scale, a scale of integration that is taking place. We are not even on the first step of the escalator. So don't even for a moment, we need to open up. That is the lesson what we can say. We need to open up to make sure our interaction with China, with Japan, gets as thick, as dense, as intense as the one that exists today between Japan and China. Uh, in terms of the larger issues, I think previously uh, what you said, look, I don't think we should oscillate between this extraordinary thing of, you talk about communists like crocodiles, I used to be an ex-communist, but they tell you that they're not crocodiles. Uh, but the communists in this country almost pulled down the previous government because it was doing something in the United States. So I think we need to get away from this paradigm of either treating Chinese as a big threat or as the greatest darling that India has ever found. Because both the trends exist in this country. What I'm making the case today is we need a realistic, pragmatic appreciation of a China that is rising in our midst, and that we must find practical ways of dealing with its power. Not by this, you know, we're not going to go back to Kennedy in any spirit. And now we're going to uh, do the 62, you know, or part of in the Chini Bhagavad phase. So both of us are rising, we need to find a way of practical accommodation. But there are two great civilizations, we've got to find ways. And I would think there is a triangular relationship, US, China, India relationship will be the defining one. But that needs to work its parameters out, and not this clarities, simplicities, of which all of us are the danger of adopting. We need a more complex or Two questions actually, because uh, so and then. Uh, good afternoon, Giovanni from Census Pool. Um, I have a question for the panel actually. Uh, you've talked all of uh, the three of you uh, quite intensively about uh, India's and China's growing presence and aspiration in each other, let's call it traditional area of interest. But what about the meeting of their conflicting interest in other areas such as uh, Central Asia? and uh, how is it going to impact uh, a broader scenario and how is the uh, U.S. envisaging uh, this growing presence of both China and India in the uh, Central Asia? Thank you. Thank you. Lisa? 
Yeah, well, I think uh, when you talk about Central Asia, of course, uh, you think about the, um, the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and, you know, I think this organization, uh, they meet, but they really haven't done anything that's had a major impact geopolitically or geostrategically. But still, India is you know, involved as, in this sort of um, And India certainly has economic interests that would like to access Central Asian energy resources. Of course, that's difficult. We have a war in Afghanistan happening. Um, so I think you know, there, there are interests there, but I just think they're, they're not really bumping up against each other tremendously uh, at the moment. Um, but certainly the potential is there. But then I think this brings us to, you know, what, how does China see Afghanistan? Um, and, you know, it's made this major investment in the copper mine. Uh, but at the same time, and, and you would think it would be very, China would be extremely concerned about stability in Afghanistan because it's got, you know, it's rested Uyghur Muslim population and it can be influenced by developments in both Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, and I think there was a hope in the Obama administration when it came in that you can, you know, uh, China could pick, play a responsible role in purging stability in these two countries. Um, but we really haven't seen that play out yet, and, and there still seems to be this um, desire to you know, have Pakistan you know, really close as an ally, uh, you know, the nuclear cooperation um, continuing. So I'm not sure how much success the Obama administration is having in terms of encouraging this uh, you know, role of China in really promoting stability, encouraging stability in particularly Bringing spot pipelines and rail yes. lines and linking the two regions. Uh, India has to still go through Pakistan and uh, So I think that is different. But then, uh, not having both the fence sometimes is good, sometimes is bad. Uh, the fact is, China, because it doesn't have a fence, or it doesn't have, it has such long borders, it's also worried about the spillover of the extremist ideas or the Islamic extremist ideas spilling over from Central Asia into, into China. So China has the advantage as well as the problems, while India is, is once removed directly. That's why I think how Russia, what kind of a role Russia plays, that's going to be the crucial one. So right now the Chinese and the Russians are operating together. But if the Chinese, if the Russians see Chinese power growing up too rapidly, I wonder what they're going to do, whether there's something we do with the Russians a lot more about this situation. Thank you. Uh, is it all? Okay. Uh, Raja Mohan had mentioned about uh, India going back to Southeast Asia, India going back to Asia. Now, my question is really, has it really gone back? Because if you really compare the quality of involvement of India at the earlier stage that we mentioned about India in the 40s, about Indian Army. But I'm not mentioning that also. I'm talking about 49, India's support in Indonesia's struggle for independence, India's role in the Korean War Resolution, India's role in the uh, International Control Commission in India China. The kind of role that India had, qualitatively, it really brought India as part of a, of a of countries which were really trying to resolve some of the crisis within the region. But what we see today, that India is in Southeast Asia much more, or entire Asia, in a more reluctant kind of a role, more at the prodding of Southeast Asian countries who needed to balance China, and that's why they want India more effectively. Because my impression, you mentioned about your experience in Singapore, but my impression also about traveling in the region is that they're quite disappointed with India's role at the moment. They want India to be much more proactive in the region. Is that what you come into? India is never going to be like China in terms of the, the clarity, the purposefulness with which once a decision is taken, the things going to move. All the important contributions you refer to, think about India did post 49, most of them were diplomatic initiatives because you had a strong drive to still do something. But we began to disconnect economically. So once you removed uh, that, you, you had a situation where in 1867, 
Singapore was part of it, India was around from the back of it. From that kind of an integrated relationship, we steadily disconnected ourselves because the kind of economic strategy was pursued. What has changed? A change is real. It is not enough. It is not satisfactory. A lot of uh, South East Asians complain about India is not doing enough. But the fact is, if you look at where we were in 1994 when the Lukis policy was announced, where we are today, but that is a dramatic change. Today, India's trade in the East has overtaken India's trade in the West. Uh, that the number of you know private sector initiatives that are going on, a large number of Indian industry will be looking for resources, mines, you name it, the different corporations. It's a dramatic expansion. Free trade agreement, the largest number in Asia today, with Thailand, with Singapore, uh, with ASEAN as a well. whole. So you, you have changed. The change is not fast enough. There's no doubt about that. But I think maybe what we're here for, I think we'll move very, very much into Asia. And I think the number of potential is huge. climate change and environment, where actually the US doesn't really set a great example, but where India and China did gang up together in the summit. So I just want to know the perspective. If we little separate from political issues, there's something about environment and climate change, where India and China can work together. Yeah, yeah my name is Rustam Sengupta. Well, you know, after the, after the COVID hit, uh, after the COVID hit, this uh, summit, uh, there was a there is a new term that described India-China relations, and it's called the Copenhagen spirit. Uh, that it was it was when India and China kind of joined forces, uh, so to speak, in Copenhagen, uh, much to the dislike of the West. But on, in, on again, I think the scale is very different. Uh, I believe uh, Raj to answer this, but I think the scale is very different. China has now officially become the largest center in the world. I think so I don't know what the question is. But beyond that, uh, the whole European Union project is a, uh, is a case where it's, uh, uh, it's geopolitical rhetoric and it's reach far exceeds its threats. No greater proof of that is what NATO, the European contribution to NATO in Afghanistan is shrinking. Uh, we have a, uh, a very difficult time keeping uh, the Europeans simply in Afghanistan, almost uh, particularly in Germany, and even increasingly in the UK, uh, the political uh, situation is such that uh, they're trying to get troops out. So it's a rather uh, ironic situation where what is the currency of power in the European Union is? It's certainly not military, it's certainly not the traditional kind of power. Uh, uh, that's right, and, and that's where the climate change issue also comes in, because they're a major driving force, and even though they were uh, making common calls with, the, with President Obama to Copenhagen. Uh, they still didn't do that. So here you have the European Union and the United States trying to push something through, and they still want to do it. I don't, I can't, that to me would say, they'd be more pessimistic about that entire movement than anything else you can possibly imagine. Uh, because China and Russia and, and, and India obviously have different uh, economic incentives here. And that's very real. That's not, you can't ideologically you talk yourself out of that. I don't care how much you you try to, uh, but that's different from advanced economy like the United States and Europe, but we can do that, but that's still not the way. So. So, I think we can do I would like to ask you a question to the faculty. Before this, you just saw destructive vessel, which was about the bipolar world, and after that, the multipolar world has happened in the local region. Do you think uh, this uh, data can be substitute for USS or for making it a bipolar world, a more stable world, or it can contribute in removal of this bigger and other types of problems? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think that China is, uh, there, there's just simply too many centers of power right now, and, and also even 
the friendship and the alliance question that the United States has right now, which is a lot more fluid, but also you're making friends with people we didn't used to be friends with, including India. Uh, so it's not just a one-way street where China's going to power is going to become more uh, of a manifestation in the future. The thing that worries me uh, is, is that, uh, and there's some, some elements of this attitude in the current administration in Washington, is that uh, a, a, a sort of a default position of belief that the United States, maybe it's because it's in a, in a position of decline, or we've got too much debt, or we've got too much on our hands, that we need to start accommodating these big powers, like China and even Russia, uh, and even do so at the expense of our friends and allies who share our values. That's a rather pessimistic view, not only of America's future, but also of the future of the world. And, uh, so I don't think that would evolve into a condominium with China and the United States or anything like that. But you could see, talking about the, this, this, this wonderful energy of bending spaces, uh, people draw conclusions when they're not about this. Uh, if the United States is seen in retreat in Asia, if it's seen in, in retreat or weakening along the borders of Russia uh, or in other places like this, the countries who are on the borders of very powerful nations will draw their conclusions, not because they want to, but because they feel they have to. Uh, and that's where, uh, that's unintended consequences of, uh, of an overtly and naive so-called engagement strategy, whether it's engaging China, engaging Iran, engaging Russia, whatever the case may be. Uh, I know it's not intended, but that's what can happen. I think, you know, the point about it that China's um, changing its economic dependency on oil start making foreign policy calculations that support those uh, economic needs, et cetera. But I think you know, it's all about transparency. And um, so I think, you know, Admiral, uh, former head of PACCOM, Admiral Keating, once said, I think he's at Heritage Foundation, in fact, when he said this, um, you know, when, when the, you had the model bar exercise between India and Singapore, Australia, in the US, uh, China became paranoid. And he was saying, you know, this is not containing China. You know, yeah, you can see, you know, the circle of whatever you want to call it, <laughs> the circle of chips. Um, but it's to draw China out. You know, we're not talking about containing, we're talking about drawing it out, um, looking for that transparency uh, from China that we don't often get. So I think you know, this is this is the point that it needs to be made. We're looking for more transparency in you know what what China is trying to do because there's a lot of skepticism. I wouldn't say paranoia, but you know there's uncertainty toward what China's long-term strategic ambitions and, and goals are. So to the extent that we can engage, draw them out, see transparency, um, this will help. Uh, absolutely, the last question. Yes. I'm Bill Kirchner, I'm from Jake Tire. Incidentally, I was one of the first few companies outsourcing part of its manufacturing to China. The question uh, with the rising level of education in China, with the rising level of affluence in China, at least in the coastal belt, uh, it should be natural that the aspiration for freedom should be going up among the population coupled with absence of individual property rights. What is the panel thing? How long this kind of governance structure can be sustained in China? I think we, what we need to, there is a theory that look, uh, that the emergence of economic prosperity or the emergence of the middle class lead to democratization. That is, you create a bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie will create democracy. So I'm using the word Marxist jargon, uh, crocodile jargon, shall we say. Uh, but, the, but the fact is, it is not something that's going to happen as a mechanical consequence. But that each country, these transitions play themselves out in complex ways. But I think there is a tendency for those of us who want to see change in China, to see it every turn. 89, when you saw the students on the street, there it is, you know, democracy, the Statue of Liberty went up in there on the square. Or, now the current labor unrest in China, some people say, look, this, yes, 
uh, this could be the beginning of, of a potentially a return of the economic turmoil, assertion of the, uh, the people. I think I don't, as a, as a policy maker or as a, as a strategist, I don't think India can bet its policies on the prospect of democratization of China. Right now, as you, as a businessman, know, there's so much money to be made, there's so much business to be done, there's so much mutual discovery to take place. After all, even today, we don't have a direct flight, not even every day, in fact, we have to wait. But we, standing next to each other, two million people, there's one hell of a lot to be done. So I won't, you know, make judgments whether it's going to happen tomorrow or there. Maybe it will happen someday, that will be great. But it is not something we can force. And even those who say they don't force it find it very difficult to sustain a policy. For example, for the West, much of the West thinks engaging China will produce democracy. And others isolating Burma might produce democracy in Burma. Because but the size of China is so big, its attractions are so large, it's very difficult to sustain a policy of externally induced change. I think China will find its way, uh, but meanwhile, what is more important for us is does Chinese power is it destabilizing? I'm not an economic economist either, uh, but I guess the, the, the simple answer, it's not so simple, but the, the clearest answer I can give is yes, in the long run, it will make a difference, but what's the long run? How long is the long run? Nobody has a, a clue. I look at, uh, at, at China's effort to, uh, uh, to modernize it this way as how like a man striding a river. Uh, with, with, with legs on each side of the banks. And uh, the richer everyone becomes, the more there's another class, the more they modernize, uh, the wider that river gets because it creates the potential for the middle class and for desire for freedom. Uh, I think they're fully aware of that. Uh, they see it as a source of instability, but on the other hand, they are absolutely committed to this because this is giving them tremendous growth rates, it's giving them greater power in the world. And they're, they're trying to harness it because they saw what happened in the Soviet Union, they saw what happened in Romania, uh, and they're determined not to go down that road as we saw in Penn Square. So it's like they're riding this tiger. Uh, in the long run, I think that, they, uh, that the tiger will get best of them. But, uh, and, they're and they're very clever about how they are actually uh, co-opting the middle class by making them uh, dependent upon the state in some fashion. And I don't mean that necessarily in subsidies and the old sort of communist way of doing things, but rather uh, in terms of getting approval for certain kinds of businesses and exports and, and, and involved in international, even in international commerce. The state is involved in all of these areas. And, uh, and therefore, this creates a tendency even for people who want to be the best capitalists in the world, they still have to have a good relationship with the government. So they're, they're, they're aware of this, they're trying their best. But I have seen in a couple of conversations, uh, uh, I've had the Chinese officials, uh, when you go to a bar, have a drink, talk about it, somehow uh, this fear of the people comes out in that. They're terrified of instability, particularly of uh, these riots and, and uh, that's occurred in the western parts of the country. Uh, so there's a tendency for them to be afraid of the masses, as it, one of them put it, but also they're, they're also concerned about what happens truly do have a bourgeois revolution in the DRC. Thank you. I think you want to have a last word? You make it real quick. This is for Solomon. Can we get a big table in the UN Assembly that no member country can send arms and munitions to another member country? <laughs> well, I, I think we should uh, wrap up because our guests are going to speak. Thank you very much, everybody, for the patient sharing. Thank you so much, Dr. Ho. Thank you so much, Lisa and Raj as well. So, uh, we will, I think we can see you all uh, here soon. And we hope to welcome you back to Delhi very soon. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.